Welcome, my name is Doug Kaiser, and it is my privilege to moderate our next panel, the panel on cosmology, law, and earth jurisprudence. As I was preparing for this role, two commonalities really stood out to me uh, among our next three speakers. First, they are all trained lawyers. Second, to my great relief uh, and excitement, they are about as far as one can be from the kind of narrow, incrementalist, petty foggery that we often associate <laughs> with lawyers. They are bold, imaginative, transformative thinkers. Uh, they, on the one hand, they eschew the narrow, insular, positivist view of law that simply studies law as a self-contained system. Uh, instead, they view law as deeply embedded in systems of morality and ecology and sociology and cosmology and so on. Um, at the same time, they also eschew the opposite extreme, which simply reduces law to an epiphenomenon of those other systems. In their work, they, they, they offer a view of law in which it has operative potential. Hence, my great excitement uh, for the conversation which we are about to hear. Uh, I'm going to introduce them very briefly in the order in which they will speak. First, we will hear from Brian Brown, uh, who's professor at Iona College. Then Pat Seaman, who's the director of the Center for Earth Jurisprudence at Barry University School of Law. And finally, Paul Walda, who's professor at Canisius College. With no further ado, I turn things over to Brian. Thank you. Thank you. On this centennial morning of the birth of Thomas Berry, and in the spirit of the journey of the universe, it is appropriate to consider an earth jurisprudence which emerges from within the corpus of his great work. For orientation, I turn to Harold Berman and his study, Law and Revolution, the formation of the Western legal tradition. In it, he identifies six great revolutions which, though distinct, shared broad commonalities. Each, he writes, marked a fundamental change in the social system as a whole. Each sought legitimacy in a fundamental law, a remote past, an apocalyptic future. Each eventually produced a new system of law which changed the Western legal tradition, but which ultimately remained within that tradition. Elsewhere, I have attempted to examine how Thomas Berry's vision of law conforms to Berman's analysis. But time limits me here to the tension between law as order and law as justice as a way of appreciating Berry's critique of law's failure and its simultaneous promise. To start, law provides a sense of clarity and codification of values around which a community organizes itself and finds coherence. Law's stability and order afford fundamental security for the community's functional transactions within itself and with others beyond. But if law is the guardian of continuity and tradition, its vitality is measured by its creative response to the changed circumstances which the particular community confronts in its identity as an embodied movement into the future. According to Harold Berman, this dynamic nature of society and the failure of law to respond to critical changes in a timely fashion are common elements in all six revolutions within the Western legal tradition. Beyond that, he argues that such failures reflect, quote, an inherent contradiction in the nature of the Western legal tradition, one of whose purposes is to preserve order and another is to do justice. Order itself is conceived as having a built-in tension between the need for change and the need for stability. Justice also is seen, in dialectical terms, involving a tension between the rights of the individual and the welfare of the community. In the great revolutions, the overthrow of the pre-existing law as order was justified as the re-establishment of a more fundamental law as justice. Here, Thomas Berry's critique of law is congruent with those moments of revolutionary transformation that have preceded it. His determination of law's inadequacy is its relative failure to address the harms to the expanded earth community and the impoverished sense of justice accorded it. Consistently, Berry deplores the devastation that imperils the earth. The severity of planetary demise is as stark as the human destructiveness which perpetrates it. 
Earth presently suffers the very disintegration of its biological integrity. Seldom, Barry writes, does anyone speak of the deficit involved in the closing down of the basic life system of the planet. This deficit is not simply the death of a living process, but of the living process. Against this enormity, law's failure is the measure of its negligible silence. If one of the fundamental functions is to preserve the stability and security for coexistence among members who subscribe to the values that law's sanctions uphold, contemporary law betrays its inadequacy even as it exposes the impoverished sense of community it deems to protect. Varying in origin, current legal systems ground their legitimacy in the sovereignty of the respective nation state whose values they claim to embody. Commonly asserted, however distinctive the efficacy, is law's intent on securing the defense and advancing the welfare of those living under its particular jurisdiction. But the narrowness of this national allegiance to citizenry well-being has been the very focus of a collective anthropocentric disregard for the integrity of life in its planetary fullness. Within the confines of so many discrete national boundaries, human concern for law's protectiveness has been largely domestic and self-referential. Such concern has not only marginalized care for Earth's fauna and flora, but has presumptively conferred entitlement over their disposition and very existence through the conceit of property. That instrument, intrinsic to the self-definition of national sovereignties, removes human intimacy with the animating presence of Earth's water, soil, and air, acquiescing their despoliation as mere resources for exploitation. The consequence of such an orientation, condoned by the rhetoric of self-protective national interests, has led to the deadly deficit of Berry's metaphor. The self-regard of human law, long propertized and extensively commercialized, has rendered it insensible and mute to the cataclysm that terminates the earth in its Cenozoic fluorescence. Of this magnitude of change, Berry writes, Something much greater is happening than is generally realized. We are witnessing nothing less than the dissolution of the planet Earth and all its living systems in consequence of this strange distortion of our human role in the Earth process. Implicit in Berry's assessment is law's inadequacy to appropriately respond to the very nature of the harm that threatens the viability of planetary life. In that regard, the failure of presently constituted legal systems, anthropic in their concern and fragmented in their native allegiances, is consistent with past revolutionary moments in the Western legal tradition. All were instigated by failures within pre-existing legal and governance structures to make timely response to the changed socio-political circumstances of the respective communities from within which each arose. From Berry's perspective, the old laws of the human community, yet insufficiently informed by the new story of cosmogenesis, are failed legal systems. Without that critical cosmology in which the creativity of the universe, shaping the solar system from within the dynamics of the Milky Way, and bringing forth the singularity of Earth as the primary community of water, soil, and atmosphere, and blooming into the profusion of life that enabled its further self-reflective emergence as human. Without that critical cosmology, human law has become dysfunctional. Like the pre-existing legal orders of past revolutionary moments, the present laws of Berry's criticism prove inattentive to and ineffective for the most profound of changes yet witnessed in human and necessarily in Earth history. However irresistible the evidence and the biosystemic pressure for revolutionary change, the rigidity of law as presently constituted order resists the urgencies of law as justice. As noted, an ambivalence within law manifests in the tension on the one hand to establish and preserve a consistency and stability, and its vital responsiveness on the other to move beyond the rigidity of that conservative tendency and to adopt timely changes which the protectiveness for the community's welfare dictates. 
given the expansive understanding of the human earth community, whose integrity has been established by the coherence of the cosmic narrative, as well as the devastation from an unreformed, exploitive anthropocentrism, and law's conservatism is without justification. Indefensible from the gravity inflicted and the risk imposed, the assault of human further compounds its illegitimacy as self-destructive. Every diminishment to Earth's self-renewal and creativity erodes human well-being in its physical and psychic capacities. It is Berry's consistent contention that as the natural world recedes under the onslaught of a technocratic dominance as progress, that the human repudiates engagement with the source of its deepest meaning. Speaking of the compound jeopardy to its own sense of purpose and capacity for fulfillment, as well as its experience of numinous reality, Berry writes that what is at stake is the meaning of existence itself. Ultimately, it is the survival of the world of the sacred. Once this is gone, the world of meaning truly dissolves into ashes. Thus, Berry exposes a legal order that so forfeits its legitimacy by so abandoning its authenticity to protect against so ultimate a harm as does the law of the terminal Cenozoic. Remaining within their originating national identities, legal codes of the early 21st century are largely uniform in their neglect for the common good of the integral earth community. To that extent, they have remained inured to the violation perpetrated by the commercial industrial ethos of extraction and consumptive exploitation, which Berry consistently renders plunder. Yet in Berry's divestiture of law's moral stature, exposed in its hollow protectiveness for organic earth, there remains an implicit recognition of law's capacity to actualize its potential beyond preserving the order of things and to claim its identity as justice. That law can sustain assessment of its own fidelity to the fundamental charge of protection against harm, that it can evaluate the evidence of a violated and threatened planetary body, that it can scrutinize and indict the commercial industrial obsession with progress towards some wishful wonder world, that it can render its conviction that such an enterprise is wanton and indefensibly criminal, and that it can issue a cease and desist order and demand restorative restitution. That law can yet fulfill these inherent charges is to step beyond its conservative inclinations and invigorate itself as revolutionary justice, as ecological justice. If the Western legal tradition has witnessed past moments of transformative potential, where law instigated by and responsive to fundamental changes within its respective setting, rejected the conditions of a pre-existing order only to extend reformative measures into a new one, the present crisis surpasses each and all of them in the dangers which evoke law's most urgent repudiation and expansive protectiveness. In the process, law will further prove its revolutionary identity by acknowledging its circumscription and capture within the confines of its own past. Here, Berry's critique of the American Constitution illustrates his censure of law's anthropocentric focus on exclusively human rights. However lofty its political achievement, however prized a model for democratic aspirations, its charter of liberties is the expression and vehicle for human self-aggrandizement with complete disregard for the limitations imposed by the larger body politic of organic earth. While protecting autonomy from tyrannous regimes, the constitutional scheme enabled a culture that knew no restraint towards other than human members of the North American community, all subsumed under the homogeneity of property. Disenfranchised and subjugated under that unexamined assumption, the living rivers and forests, prairies and peaks, and the host of beings inhabiting them became the commodified objects of possessory human disposition. Law, in its expression as constitutional freedom, 
restricted and confined as a human prerogative, left unprotected those living communities beyond the pale of its recognition. In fact, it facilitated their ruin through its constrictive self-identification with the commercial industrial commitments of the corporation enterprise. In making this charge, Berry cites Morton J. Horowitz's two-volume, The Transformation of American Law. Its findings on the collaboration of the legal profession and judiciary with the commercial entrepreneurial ambitions in the first decades after the American Revolution presage the rise and dominance of an increasing corporate control. Horowitz writes, as political and economic power shifted to merchants and entrepreneurial groups in the post-revolutionary period, they began to forge an alliance with the legal profession to advance their own interests through a transformation of the legal system. Law, once conceived of as protective, regulative, and above all, a paramount expression of the moral sense of the community, had come to be thought of as facilitative of individual desires and as simply reflective of the existing organization of economic and political power. By the middle of the 19th century, the legal system had been reshaped to the advantage of men of commerce and industry at the expense of farmers, workers, consumers, and other less powerful groups within the society. Berry, confirmed by Horowitz's research, exposes the moral failure of law as it succumbed to the narrow interests of the commercial industrial enterprise and its ultimate expression in the multinational corporation. For Berry, the legal prerogatives favoring the interests of corporate dominance not only excluded and marginalized whole classes of citizenry, but further remove law's protective recognition for the other than human world, more effectively bound as the objects of commerce advance. But the injustice of a legal economic consortium as that which emerged early, however subtly, within an American context to become the model for a current global control is implicitly betrayed not only by its elitist subversion of democratic principles of personal freedom and participatory government, it is likewise condemned by the indefensible jeopardy of its assault on the viability of planetary life, the constant witness of Berry's prosecution. Here again, law as justice is called to reclaim its authenticity over its discredited collusion with and at the behest of a privileged corporate network and the dysfunctional order of its permissive earth plunder. Law's capacity to yet register harm weigh evidence and sustain a claim against the wanton violence of a system which it had facilitated but now renders unsustainable is the reclamation of its own revolutionary foundations and the necessary step towards its own reinvention. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, for those deep and urgent and moving words. Next, Pat Seaman. Okay. Thank you. I also want to add my, my voice of gratitude to Mary Evelyn and John for the invitation to be here and for this extraordinary conference. It is a, truly, again, an honor to speak on Thomas's 100th birthday. And I had the privilege of meeting with him from, through two, from 2006 through the spring of 2009 as we started the Center for Earth Jurisprudence. He indeed was our inspiration. So my talk wants to focus on three sections. First of all, what is Earth Jurisprudence? To give some examples of how it might be able to be, is trying to be concretized. And finally, to look at some incrementally, some legal tools we currently have to help facilitate bringing forth an Earth Jurisprudence. So to begin, Earth jurisprudence is an emerging field of law within the environmental law arena. Um, it, it, it takes, Earth jurisprudence takes both a jurisprudential approach as well as a concrete applicable approach. It looks at, and I do not want to ever give this up, the jurisprudential part, what ought law to do? 
And so how do we extend legal protection to all beings and entities belonging to the Earth community? How do we make the shift from an erroneous assumption that we humans are not a part of the larger natural world, and our laws are premised on the assumption that humans are separate from the larger world? So how do we adopt a new legal paradigm that moves from the property law concept that Brian already uh, mentioned, and it is embedded in every aspect of law, not just environmental law. But, and so how do we move from that concept of property, ownership of all being, to one that respects the inherent rights of all beings under the law? This is a huge shift for the Western world, not necessarily for indigenous world cultures. They do often have the traditions and practices of protecting, and they don't even have to put them into laws. Uh, to, like we do. So it's a huge shift for our Western world and anyone proposing that Earth has the right to moral and legal consideration is, believe me, often deemed foolish and not li living in a real world, especially if you're in the legal academy. So as I, be want, as I begin my presentation, I want to introduce the archetypal energy of the court jester. Can you give me a moment. <laughs> the court jester is an ubiquitous character whose role includes risking his or her life to speak truth to the king. Today we would say that would be the political and economic rulers, possibly the Koch brothers of our day the fossil fuel giants driving our planet and human community into extinction. The court jester in medieval times risked telling the truth to the king, especially when the king was blinded by error, with the hope that the king would mend his, was his, ways and avoid grave harm to the kingdom. So I propose that Earth needs lots of court jesters. People who are willing to speak the truth of cosmological, geobiochemical, and psychic spiritual functions of the universe so that laws and policies can de develop that will govern the integrity and survival of the Earth community. Court jesters are needed to speak to the political and economic and religious leaders of today about what is at stake for Earth and all species survival. Given the conserving role of law that Brian has just explicated for us, the, that is the role to enforce, protect, safeguard the established order, it is risky to tell our kings today that their dominating system of law and economics is woefully inadequate and destructive to the health of the whole. And as my colleague Paul, I am sure, going to point out, we need a new legal system that can bring forth the future we imagine, and we need to be able to do that now. And we need to be able to move forward the revolutionary role of law. So what is the future we imagine? For me, it is one that respects and protects the wider and widest comprehensive community of life. One that provides both moral and legal consideration for all members of the Earth community. A future where, where all being is appreciated for its subjectivity and interiority rather than being perceived as objects to be consumed and commercialized. Current Western legal systems are premised on property law concepts. All being, and even some humans, are considered commodities to be bought and sold in the market. The only value that ecosystems, rivers, birds, insects, plants, fungi hold under the law is primarily the value that can be gained on the market when bought or sold. Aesthetics and their own intrinsic value is not considered a viable legal factor. Advocating that the inherent value of a river or a bird song be morally and legally considered to be protected is considered frivolous 
within the legal system. A lawyer can even be charged with bringing a frivolous suit today for claiming that an ecosystem has an inherent right to be protected. Yet an important shift is happening. The moral and legal consideration of nature is being expanded. Natural communities are being granted legal recognition and standing in some minority jurisdictions. For example, just this week, with the November 4th elections, two communities, one in Athens, Ohio, and another in Mendocino County, California, uh, voted to adopt a community bill of rights banning corporate rights to conduct hydraulic mm. fracturing in their communities. Mm. And that community bill of rights also secures specific rights to a healthy environment, local self-governance, and recognizing the rights of nature. These visionary community activists who are advancing an earth jurisprudential approach to protecting the inherent rights of nature to exist and flourish are examples of today's court jesters. They are speaking to the political and economic leaders of their community about the requisite balance needed for healthy community ties, and they are initiating a long process of legal challenges. They are flying directly into the face of long-standing legal interpretations of the Commerce Clause that has accreted all legal rights to corporate commerce, regardless of the consequences to the natural communities. I have been engaged in the emerging field of earth jurisprudence for the last eight years, and I have witnessed an incredible advance in the theory and application of earth jurisprudence. The first conference even naming earth jurisprudence as a field of law was held in Arleigh, Virginia in 2001. It was there that Thomas Berry first used the language of an earth jurisprudence, and he said, as he has done in his writings, earth needs a new jurisprudence. He tested there his thesis on origin, differentiation, and the role of rights, those principles at that time at that meeting. Building on Christopher Stone's Revolutionary Law article of 1972, Should Trees Have Standing?, Barry advanced foundational principles for a new legal system that included considerations of Earth's cosmological functions and inner dynamics as well. His first principle was that rights originate where existence originates. That that which determines existence determines rights. Now I want to note that Barry was speaking of qualitative, not necessarily quantitative rights in this. That is, he is speaking of the inherent and unique rights of differentiated beings. All rights are not the same, qualitatively or quantitatively. For example, Barry distinguished fish rights from river rights from human rights. If you do his reading, and he says, a fish doesn't need human rights. We make the point, so a lot of the fear is that we're going to just get totally litigious and that everybody, every entity is going to want human rights. They don't need human rights. They need their own rights. So Barry went on to say that the natural world on planet Earth gets its rights from the same source that humans get their rights, from the universe that brought them into being. Thus, human rights are nested within Earth rights, and Earth rights are primary. The Universal Declaration on the Rights of Mother Earth, which was adopted at the People's Convention on the Rights of Mother Earth and Climate Change in Cochabamba, Bolivia in 2010, was written as one of the first articulations of the rights of Mother Earth. It was deliberately framed on the model of the Declaration of Human Rights adopted by the United Nations in 1948. I attended that convention. And there were over 35,000 people there in Cochabamba, Bolivia, of which 90% were indigenous peoples. The US press didn't even mention the occasion of this convention. And the Obama administration refused to allow any State Department 
any State Department official or government officials to attend, not wanting to give credence to a leftist-leaning coalition of Andean countries trying to exert independence from the hegemony of Western governments and economies. This conference came right after the failed Copenhagen Co Climate Change Conference. And when that failed, President uh, Morales of Bolivia said, if the UN can't do it and the Climate Conference can't do it, we're going to call a People's Convention, which is why that came forth. So Earth jurisprudence is about changing the framework of law and public policy from an anthropocentric property law, commodity ownership model to one where our laws protect and conserve the inherent rights of nature and people to exist, flourish, and fulfill their roles in an ever-evolving universe. It, I think it is important to note that Earth jurisprudence and Earth laws do not bestow rights on nature. Those rights already exist. The process is to recognize them and to give legal protection. At its essence, Earth jurisprudence prefers that humans voluntarily self-regulate their own behavior towards the rest of the web of life. The laws that need to emerge from an evolved consciousness and values that recognize the interdependence of the human community is what we seek. We know, however, that law initiates policies and rules too far in advance. When laws are advanced too far, when, when laws are adopted too far in advance of the consciousness of the people, the laws will fail. They will not be enforced. So if there's a tension here. Law seldom leads, and yet it does have the possibility to be revolutionary. And yet if it does get too revolutionary, or it leads too quickly, they don't get implemented. So for example, in, in 2008, the Ecuador adopted a new constitution that provides legal rights of nature, Article 71 of that constitution. And it says, nature or Pachamama, where life is reproduced and exists, has the right to exist, persist, maintain, and regenerate its vital cycles and structures, functions, and processes in evolution. That's in their constitution. It also provided legal standing to nature and to it, it authorized people to be able to bring forth cases to protect nature. However, as Ecuador's economy deteriorated, in the last few years, since 2008, shortly after that constitution was adopted, President Correa has backtracked on those constitutional protections. So that last December in 2013, he opened up a vast area of the Yasuni National Park area to exploitation of mining by Chinese companies. There was huge civil resistance to this, particularly from indigenous peoples. Those contracts were signed and the mining is beginning and as indigenous peoples in, protect, in particular are fighting for the rights, they are the ones being criminalized and going to jail and the mining extraction is all legal. So I have in my paper actually developed, uh, have offered some of the models of how the core principles of differentiation, community, and subjectivity can begin to be protected through using some of the legal tools of guardianship, public trust, uh, precautionary principle, that I'll let that be if you're interested in pursuing. Um, in conclusion, I want to say that Earth jurisprudence is the work of people called at this time to care for Earth's greatest good. Not to pay attention and to act with loving attention and resilience may be the most foolish decision we have ever made. Hope for survival and celebration of Earth's beauty and bounty lies in building momentum to care for Earth, as demonstrated recently at the Climate March in New York City, where over 625,000 people globally gathered to illustrate their demands that global leaders actually become leaders. I heard there someone say, don't call them global leaders, they're not leading. Call them representatives of government. <laughs> so if we need to say that, <laughs> I, I thought it was right on. So, so if the leaders don't lead, then the people need to. 
And sometimes that's the best way for change to happen. Usually it is. Change has to happen from the bottom. And cultures need to change. So I say, I say that it is time that we all become court jesters, willing to tell the truth to the rulers today. Let us not be afraid to be seen as foolish. <laughs> I'll put it on later. Put on our outfits. I'll loan it to anyone, thank you. Thank you, Pat. I, I am actually suddenly much more optimistic for the possibility of <laughs> <laughs> the possibility of a law that's inclusive of all life, because prior to this day, I never thought I would see an audience at an academic conference taking pictures as if they were at a Taylor Swift con concert. <laughs> so, Pat, thank you for being the rock star of Earth jurisprudence. <laughs> Finally, we'll hear from Paul Waldo. Tough acts to follow, huh? <laughs> uh, to the children to all the children, to the children who swim beneath the waves of the sea, to those who live in the soils of the earth, to the children of the flowers in the meadows and the trees in the forest, to all those children who roam over the land and the winged ones who fly with the winds, to the human children too, that all the children may go into the future in the full diversity of their regional communities. This foregrounding of children in the dedication uh, of the great work projects from one vantage point a common sense that is both communal and ecological. Yet there are circles in today's frictiony world where talking about children in this way or about a multi-species communion of subjects would be taken as nothing less than a taunt that hints at, as an American evangelical put it, moral equivalency that violates what often has been held to be humans truly great work, namely rising above animality. Those who proclaim, frankly, I am an animal, thus are perceived today in many powerful circles to threaten not only human superiority and privilege over other animals, but also human dignity itself. In the second part of this paper, I talk about law as one of those unfriendly circles. I leave to the side much evidence that would reveal, if included, that higher education, public policy circles, mainline religious institutions, and any number of science domains are, like modern legal systems, decidedly unfriendly to all the children, but especially those who swim beneath the waves of the sea, live in the soils of the earth, and fly with the winds. Here, I address those inclined to separate humans, to hold them apart and above any and all non-human animals, most particularly I want to invite to make community, to dialogue with, and companion those of us who regard the strategy of separating human from other than human lives as advisable. I argue instead that any such strategy defeats all life, both human and non-human animals alike, and plants too. Although I make a number of arguments about the many ways separation is a worse than bad strategy, a hint of how I argue can be discerned in the voice of a medical doctor whose focus is humans alone. This is John Rady of Harvard Medical School. Much of the damage that we inflict on ourselves, on others, and certainly on the natural world stems from extreme adherence to the notion of human exceptionalism. The word children works encompassingly in Thomas's dedication precisely because this powerful word is both nimble and deep enough to allow us to marvel at our multi-species heritage and community. Talking, as Thomas does then, is making community. And whenever we make community, we make morals. Said another way, recognizing our memberships in a number of nested communities, including those replete with other than human animals in our shared more than human world, advances our own moral development. Over recent millennia, humans need to notice and take seriously the other than human members of our Earth community is an insight that individuals and group, groups have repeatedly developed and nurtured, only to have their descendants ignore this insight 
eventually to forget it entirely. Thankfully, discovery of, discovery of the importance of noticing and taking other living beings seriously has been made again and again. An early version is the first millennium BCE insight of the Axial Age sages. I quote here from Karen Armstrong. Nearly all the Axial sages realized that you could not confine your benevolence to your own people. Your concern must somehow extend to the entire world. Respect for the sacred rights of all beings, not orthodox belief, was religion. 20th century versions of this insight abound. Some frame the issue as one of human possibilities, as in Viktor Frankl's recognition that self-actualization is possible only as a side effect of self-transcendence. Going beyond the important realm of individual self-actualization are insights about species-level challenges. Said simply, our species needs to make community with the more-than-human world. A moving statement of this key insight is Aldo Leopold's mid-20th century exhortation for humans to evolve from, quote, conqueror of the land, community, to a plain member and citizen of it. Here in the early 21st century, debates about our own health now prompt us to go wild. Harvard Medical School's John Rady uses this mantra to bring home the insight that we are wild animals in order to give us a prescription for health and flourishing that contrasts greatly with the diseases of civilization that the subtitle of his 2014 book calls out. As or even more important than our adult health, for our children, um, something beyond mere medical health is at stake, as Richard Louvre has pointed out for decades. At stake is the healthy and full cognitive development of our human children. This is the message of Louvre's groundbreaking 2005 Last Child in the Woods, which carries the subtitle, Saving Our Children from Nature Deficit Disorder. So let me give thanks, count blessings, point out good news. This conference, the Forum on Religion and Ecology, Journey of the Universe, Thomas Berry, Mary Evelyn and John, and so many, many others here and not here, have helped us arrive at a place where we can again rediscover yet again that our species suffers repeatedly, repeatedly from the affliction of ignoring and forgetting the key insight that we are but one life form among an astonishingly rich and decidedly more than human community. All of these efforts help us to once again realize inclusivist community building efforts <laughs> that bring us home to our larger community nurture eudaimonic flourishing in a communion of subjects and permit us a clear awareness that humans are animals and will always be animals and that we become remarkable only when we acknowledge such realities fully. So I invite you to go on the journey, really it's a re-journey, that helps us repudiate the now long-standing tendencies which have prompted humans to pretend that we are in any sense separate and apart from our Earth community and its non-human citizens. We are exceptional animals, yes, 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 but we are at our most exceptional, that is in Frankel's terms, we self-actualize, only when we transcend our own species by humbly acknowledging our larger community. The irony, of course, is that we are exceptional only when we, in Leopold's framing, recognize our plain membership in the land community. In these ways, we challenge the dysfunctional, exceptionalist tradition that has deceived us into claiming that we are separate from and superior to our natural home. Let me skip ahead in the paper a bit. There's a heading entitled, Law, Dreaded or Enchanted Future. In summary, today's legal systems the legal establishment and legal educators, despite some noteworthy trends, have yet to scale the arduous paths that lead to fundamental change in the dysfunctions that ensue when human exceptionalism and its underlying speciesism prevail. Today's legal systems are bastions of the modern world's forgetfulness and denial on the question of our larger community, and thereby they prompt many to commit the fallacy of misplaced community. As much or more than other key modern institutions. The legal system holds in place the modern world's dismissal of other than human animals 
and the more than human world, thereby ensuring our species related slide away from the role of plain citizen and responsible community member and many of the nested communities of which we are an integral part. In this, contemporary law reminds one of Virgil's sobering admonition, easy is the descent to hell. Day and night the doors stand open, but to retrace one's steps, to come out again into the upper air, this is the task and burden. American law's basic conceptuality, as you've heard, presently is the dualism, legal persons versus legal things. This is the stark and inadequate framing projected onto reality by the law we have inherited. Like so many forms of education that, to quote David Orr, equip people merely to become more effective vandals of the earth. Law does more than harm us. It is complicit in our failure to self-transcend and thus our failure, failure to self-actualize. I raise five themes in the rest of this paper that undergird um, these observations. Let me just read them in part of one. Theme one, any tendency to separate humans from other animals, whether this is, whether this is done via moral discourse, spiritual discourse, metaphysical analyses, or legal systems will inevitably harm humans. This is the thrust of the challenge to human exceptionalism. I hasten to add one possible exception, namely a certain manner of exceptionalizing humans that in the manner of Socrates being held the wisest man in Athens because he alone was willing to admit his own ignorance, we might fairly deem ourselves the most special of animals in but one particular circumstance. This claim is true only when we are fundamentally humble about being one animal citizen, albeit a powerful and insightful one, in a more than human world. I personally welcome ways of speaking and acting that insist we be integrated and as delightful and very interesting members of the larger community that constitutes our greater self. I think such a way of, speak, uh, such a way of speaking honors humans. And I am impressed by those who achieve such humility as perhaps the most, most special animals I know. A corollary of this is that separation cannot be functional. In an ecological universe, there can be delightful and very interesting members of our larger community, <laughs> but there is no separation, no superiority, and no functional version of dismissal of any and all non-human living beings. Theme two, our heritage is impoverished because exceptionalism is now the foundation of, as Brian pointed out, many modern legal systems. The legal persons, us, versus legal things, everything else, remains all too congenial to a persisting Cartesian dualism, escapist forms of spirituality, and the industrial scale harms that, accept it, that are accepted by both religious and secular societies. Theme three, there is some good news. Legal education has for a decade and a half been newly hospitable to a variety of voices challenging the dualism, humans and animals. As wrong-headed, arrogant, and ultimately a misconceived notion. There is another front outside of legal education that is providing good news. Contemporary scholars in many different fields today are hard at work on identifying the constant rediscovery of humans' connections to and needs for community with other than human animals. Theme four, avow our animality and be plain citizens. Theme five, recover and reproject the, our law, thereby projecting an imagined future upon reality that is ethically attuned, scientifically literate, spiritually alive, and ecologically integrated. If we do that, I think we have, as the title of this paper is, hope for law and other animals in a more than human world. Thank you. We often hear debates um, from the public and others um, wondering whether we have too many lawyers. I think there can be no doubt we have too few lawyers like these. Thank you. 
Rather than dominate discussion, I would love to allow the audience a chance mm -hmm. to ask questions and respond. This was a lot of provocative and stimulating uh, discourse that we've had already. I see hands going up. Again, short questions, so we got lots of discussion going. Having just been in Ecuador and seen the incredible outrage about Yasuni, two questions. One, is there anything to do about it? And two, what do you think the role of civil disobedience has been in raising that issue as well as Keystone here? Uh, I, I was hoping that um, some of you might con comment on our children's trust and the casework that they've been doing. The Massachusetts Conference of the United Church of Christ just became an amicus to their Supreme Court case mm -hmm. that just was brought a few days ago. Um, Albert Einstein thought that world peace would only come about through world governance. And I'm wondering if we can make ecological progress on a global scale without that sort of world governance. Um, what can be done in light of the current um, electoral situation um, I understand that the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the Atlant whatever the Atlantic European trade deal are being pushed ahead and giving the World Bank, the World Trade Organization, uh, power to take away whatever rights of, for labor and environment seem to be left. What can we do about that? And are legal organizations and law schools actively trying to regain rights that are disappearing? This is a question for Paul. I, I'd really appreciate it if you could restate the name of that book when you were speaking about uh, children and what's at stake. Thank you. Richard, Richard Louvre, Last Child in the Woods. Yeah. L-O-U-V, -L Richard Louvre. Who loved Thomas Berry also. Yeah. Yeah. Bob Moriarty. Yeah. How possible do you think it might be and what might be the consequences, positive and or negative, of our dissolving the legal construct that purports to tell us that a corporation is a person? Ooh. Ashwini. Um, I was just hoping you could speak more to um, how Earth jurisprudence as a counter narrative can deconstruct the subaltern and how it can serve to elude the seemingly inevitable unintended consequences of, um, that arise from these sort of meta, super we local. We, need, uh, we can't hear it. Okay. Okay. Um, sorry about that. So I was just hoping you could speak to how um, the Earth's jurisprudence as a counter narrative can deconstruct the subaltern and how it serves to elude the unintended consequences that do arise from meta, super local discourses and, uh, and uh, these unintended consequences of silencing and rendering invisible certain populations. So basically, you know, who and what will remain left out, unheard or unseen? This is not a question, it's a comment. Uh, thank you so much for convincing us that we are animals. Yes, indeed, we are animals, but uh, I'm not too sure. I'm not really not sure uh, that we are the most special animals, but I'm pretty sure that we are the most responsible animals since we are most more, much more mobile than the trees. What do you... What we have done to the trees is just cutting the trees. Thank you. I wonder if any of the members of the panel could comment on whether they think the recent efforts to vest non-human primates with rights and greater protection is a promising trend or it is just separating the primates from the rest of the animal world. Paul Wadeau has been part of that effort for 20 years, the rights of the primates. Yeah. And I just want to say Ashwini in the back is a graduate student here who's going on to, st to do work in garbage and recycling, and the subaltern meaning those who get squished. <laughs> so I wanted to just highlight Ashwini. Any other one more question? You're going to have a lot to answer here. Okay. I, I could start with the Ecuador question. Um, 
And so what's going on in Ecuador right now um, is very vital and very vibrant. And, and it is highlighting for us the, the tensions that take place as peoples want to bring about these changes, but they are withheld within because of the economic behemoths that are just behemoths that are just in front of them. So that actually President Correa did not want, I mean, he was actually in support of the constitutional changes until the economics system bailed out, uh, the bottom went out in, in his country. And then he, I mean, then the oil and energy people got to him as this is what we're going to do and went to the most protected areas. This happens over and over and over again. So it's, it's illustrative that until we have a different economic system as well, law and economics have to shift together. Um, and yet that Ecuador would actually put this language in their constitution has given hopes to many other countries and states that this can happen. Um, and then civil, disobe just civil disobedience, I think the value of that is living this in our own integrity and witnessing to others. And there is a power in civil disobedience that goes beyond all written words and we never know the potential of that shifting the momentum in the other direction. Well, I for one am happy to be a mere moderator and not a panelist after that slate of questions. Um, there's a lot to tackle there. Um, Paul, would you like to yeah, go Yeah, sure. There? Well, there's so many questions there. And let me address the primates question. I, I must have spoken to a half dozen reporters when the most recent efforts were going on, and I care immensely, and I, uh, I'll be frank what I said. I thought, I don't think they win, those movements, but I do think they condition people to see possibilities. But I hope they win. But I do think there is this risk that by um, foregrounding the non-humans most like us, we surreptitiously affirm that we are the measure. But believe me, in a speciesist world where there's only humans inside the circle, getting one other kind of animal in <laughs> is going to change the game somewhat. But by no means would that victory in court change things fundamentally. It is a call to continue to change. I think one of the um, most important things that we're challenged to do is to uh, uh, be very, very wary about the voices that we are allowing corporate entities to have uh, in the determination of our discourse, in the determination of our values, uh, in the determination of our, our, our politics. Um, I think that uh, uh, it's, it's very, very worrisome. And as we think about uh, law as order, we need to uh, really think very carefully about the order that we wish to establish uh, and whose voices will be recognized in that order. Uh, I think it is appropriate, quite frankly, to uh, re analyze and to re-question uh, the wisdom of uh, corporate personhood and the uh, continued uh, bestowal of rights uh, to engage in unlimited uh, financial spending in uh, political processes. I, th I think it's, it is fundamentally a challenge to our democracy. And I do think that it's very hopeful that uh, peoples are uh, taking actions in their local communities. I think uh, th that is uh, something that we do see throughout uh, the, the, the states, uh, this concern that people have uh, for the way in which they see themselves living now and the way in which they do not want to see them, their children living uh, and beginning to challenge, actively challenge, uh, and, and take back uh, their own voices uh, against uh, a corporate hegemony. Uh, Mike, let me add on the question of co corporations as persons. When you're in law school, remember this, Doug, you, you learn there is a point to this. There is a way in which it can be administered in a fair and valuable way for our uh, body politic, multi-species as it is. <laughs> but 
it has been abused. So I saw once an accounting of the first 500 cases brought into the 14th Amendment, something like 95% of them were on behalf of corporations. So we used the 14th Amendment, originally passed to protect humans, to start defeating humans, but of course the non-humans as well. It's an amazing abuse of the system, so some fundamental change needs to take place. I would agree. And I, I just want to weigh in on two of the other questions that came. Uh, one about the global scale of world governance and whether that's uh, something that we want to actually put forward as a, as a major meta narrative. Um, from my perspective, I think we want to do twofold. I think we do want to be able to promote these core principles on a global arena and therefore using the United Nations as one of the forums for introducing the concepts of the rights of nature and get the dialogue moving within the countries and supporting it where it's already coming from is really important. At the same time, for Earth jurisprudence to be effective, I believe it needs to be as close to the people in the distinctive cultures and the distinctive areas because the solutions have to come from the people and the land in each region. I believe there's enough uniformity, unity in a good sense about what those core principles are, but it's going to be far more effective if it happens uh, community by community and then there's a regional coalition rather than being superimposed by some single whatever world governance. Today there's such skepticism and rightfully so around that. Secondly, just to say that I think that the uh, very creative initiative of our Children's Trust, which is really uh, youth challenging climate change, saying that the atmosphere is, needs to be perceived as an entity held in trust for future generations. And that's the core legal concept going forward. And it's having some incredible uh, energy and uh, education around rethinking the atmosphere from the eyes of children that they have a right to be healthy in the future. Now that is still taking the, the, the primary, primarily human-centered approach to this, but we have to claim our own humanness and that, that I can see that advancing the legal system somewhat. Well, terrific. I don't know about you. I, I am so invigorated I could almost skip lunch at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we can't. <laughs> before that, wow, I, I want to say just briefly, you know, Thomas Berry more than 15 years ago had this notion of the need for an earth jurisprudence and earth rights and so on, and, and wild law of Cormac McCullen was deeply inspired by that. And each of these three individuals before us have taken those ideas, Paul with the animal, more than human animal world, uh, and... Um, and Pat founding an Earth Jurisprudence Center, which is astounding, the first of its kind. Within a law school. <laughs> yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And Brian Brown taking for more than 40 years the ideas of Thomas Berry and weaving them in to law and as well as the world's religions is extraordinary. And he did a book on the rights of indigenous peoples as well. And then I want to really give a very special thanks to um, Doug Kaiser, because he came across the, the yard, as we would say, uh, from the law school to the forestry school, where our offices happened to be. And he said, would you like to teach a course together? I almost fell over. <laughs> and <laughs> incredible. And we are, we're going to start that in the spring. And I hope it goes on for a long, long time because I know we are going to learn so much from Doug Kaiser and uh, his writing, his thinking. We're having people visit in the class. But as well, we've got some great students who will be TAing that, John Hines and Joanna Defoe. And that is one of the ways this will go forward. This is the point of a living cosmology. Cosmology does have ethics in very plural form. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>